All right. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Wednesday night service at Grace Community Church. My name is Wade. Uh, for y'all tuning in, if you don't know me, and uh, thank y'all for coming out. Let me go ahead and pray, and we'll just dive right in. Father, I just thank you again for the opportunity to get up here and just share your word. And I, I just pray, Lord, that you would speak through me what you once said. And Lord, I just pray that you would uh, help people to just let their minds calm down and uh, to be able to focus, Lord, and not be worried about the, the things of the day. Help us just to, just to calm down and listen to you for a while. And we just turn it over to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I know sometimes for me, I have to just calm down for a few minutes, especially if it's been a real hectic day. And some days are like that. But I'm glad you're here. Uh, last week, we talked about getting planted somewhere and getting involved, you know, with a, a church family and letting our roots grow down into Christ so that we can mature in our faith and in our relationship with God and, you know, grow those friendships that we need in a church community and so that we can live the life that God wants us to have. And, uh, you know, after service last week, I went home and I got to thinking and I was wondering, you know, why don't more people get planted? You know, why aren't, why aren't more people coming to God? And I know a lot of them are, you know, just like I was, I told you last week, living a lifestyle that goes against God, and they're just not willing to give that up. And I believe that is a whole lot of them. And, uh, you know, like I told you last week, I totally get that. I spent most of my life living out that sort of lifestyle. But that's that's not who I'm talking about this week. Uh, this week, I'm talking about people who were in church at one time or may still be in church and, uh, you know, they were active in church, living happy lives, and for some reason or another, just don't have anything to do with church anymore or don't want anything to do with God anymore. So that's who I'm going to talk about this week. And I got to thinking, you know, what, what makes people do something like that? What makes you just walk away from your church and, you know, away, away from all your friendships and stuff? And the biggest reason, I believe, or that I've seen personally, that people stop coming to church or the reason they go back to their old lifestyle is because somebody somehow offended them or hurt their feelings somehow. You know, something's happened to them somewhere along the line that they got offended and uh, they blame God for it. You know, I tell you all the time that we're ambassadors for Christ and when we do something against somebody they don't I mean sure they get mad at us but ultimately they take it out on the God and the church that's why they they leave the church not only do they blame you they blame the church too and uh, you know a lot of times we like to to think it's today's society that led people to be so unforgiving and unwilling to to reconcile in their friendships and relationships but uh you know, it's, that's not true. That goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Today, today's society, you know, it don't help things. It's not good, but it's not anything new. Uh, like I said, all the way back in the Garden when Adam and Eve sinned, you know, he blamed her, she blamed Satan. <clears throat> so nobody wants to take the responsibility. We just blame other people. And we get mad at them and we're unwilling to reconcile. So we just go our own way. And I do believe that the reason most people quit coming is, is because they've been offended. And they're either not willing to forgive themselves or they've offended somebody and they're not willing to receive uh, forgiveness from them. It says in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 19, that a brother that's offended is harder to be one than a strong city, and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. So when somebody gets offended, it's it's really hard to get them to trust you anymore. It, sometimes it's even hard to, to just get them to talk to you. 
And because when we get offended, our pride just naturally kicks in. You know, when we, depending on how we're offended, most of the time, even if we are walking in the Spirit, you know, it's our nature to just automatically jump out of the Spirit and go right back to our, our fleshly desires. We either get mad, you know, we go into defense mode, and we either get mad or somebody hurts us so bad that it, you know, it, it hurts us. It crushes our spirit. Uh, in Proverbs 18, too, it says, 18 verse 14, it says, The spirit of a man will sus sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear? So whether you're angry or somebody hurt your feelings really bad, you know, you have the same effect. And uh, they're both caused by the same thing. Whether you're angry or hurt, you know, it still boils down to pride. You know, you can either be like, I can't believe you did that to me, and be mad, or you're going to be, I never ever thought you would do me like that. You know, you, you get hurt, and it, it crushes your spirit. But both of those are considered pride. And then uh, Proverbs 16, verse 18, the first part of the verse says, Pride goes before destruction. And uh, that's either way. You know, anger causes destruction. When you crush somebody's spirit, that causes destruction in the relationship just as much as anger does. And without reconciliation, you know, relationships are destroyed. I've seen so many relationships destroyed in the past two years, it, it just breaks my heart. I mean, people that were friends for years, some of them, you know, had known them since they were teenagers. And uh, because of one offense or one argument or one disagreement or something like that, then they just throw the relationship away like it, like it didn't mean a thing. And the only two reasons that uh, any relationship can't be reconciled is either one party or both parties is not willing to forgive or one or both of them will not admit to doing anything wrong. And we have to be willing to do both those things. You know, the best thing anybody can do, you know, we, we all make mistakes. I don't care who you are. Eventually, you are going to make a mistake. And when we do make a mistake, we need to take responsibility for it, you know, quickly. As soon as we realize, I shouldn't have done that, or I shouldn't have said that, or I, I hurt their feelings, or I made them mad, you know, we need, to, we need to take care of that quickly. That's why people are so unwilling to forgive, is because most of the time the guilty party is unwilling to admit being wrong. You know, they, they want to protect themselves. Their pride kicks in. Oh, I, I didn't do it. But we've got to be willing to admit when we're wrong, because when we don't, that is a surefire way to end a relationship. But on the flip side of that, you know, when we're quick to say I'm sorry or that was my fault, you know, I was wrong, and ask somebody, would you please forgive me, most of the time, you know, forgiveness is a whole lot more likely if we'll go up to that person and say, hey, I, I know I was wrong, please forgive me. And uh, most times people are willing to say, that's okay, I forgive you, you know. So when we have done something wrong to somebody and we know it, I don't think we should even wait for them to bring it up to us. I think we should take it to them first and say, hey, you know, I messed up, I'm sorry. How can I, what can I do to make it right? That goes a very long way in any relationship and is just, you know, taking responsibility for what we've done. It's not that hard to forgive somebody when they're telling you, I screwed up and I know it. You know, in Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 1, it says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. So if we'll go to that person in love and kindness and tell them, I know I screwed up, you know, and please forgive me, most of the time it turns their wrath away and uh, they will forgive you on the spot most of the times, but if we if we refuse to take responsibility and say I didn't do it and we won't, you know, own up to what we've done, then it says right there that that stirs up anger. All we're doing is 
creating an argument. So when we do mess up, we need to take it to God first and confess it to Him so we're not carrying around the shame of it. And then after you've took it to God and prayed about it, you know, God will give you the courage to go to that person and make it right with them. You won't have to go on your own strength because that's, that's not easy to do. Go up to somebody and, and tell them what you've done first and then humble yourself and ask them to forgive you. That's, that's hard to do on our own steam. But if we'll take it to God and confess it and talk with God first, then we'll have the, the courage to go to that person and ask God to help us help us make it right. Uh, but, you know, if we don't go quickly, like I was saying a minute ago, and we let some time go by, most of the time we'll talk ourselves out of it. We'll start listening to ourselves. You know, I told you last week, our hearts are deceitfully wicked, you know, desperately wicked. We don't, we have no idea how wicked our heart is. So the longer we, we take to own up to what we've done, that just gives us more time to talk ourselves out of apologizing. You know, we'll either wind up trying to justify it, you know, we'll think, well, they deserved it, or, uh, or we'll do like Adam and Eve did, and we'll just try to cast the blame onto somebody else. So it's important to, to take it to God quickly when we know we've screwed up. Uh, or we'll just start thinking like, well, I wouldn't have done that if they hadn't done this. Or, we, you know, we can come up with an endless line of excuses. But when we take it to God and truly pray about what we did, He'll show us what it really looks like through His eyes. You know, even if we don't understand when somebody's mad at us, if we talk to God about it, and uh, I mean with an open mind and a pure heart, talk to God about it. He'll show us what the situation looks like from all views and not just our own view. And uh, he'll also show you the value of that relationship. You know, is what you're arguing about, is it is it worth your relationship? And that'll, you know, that'll change your, change your reaction a lot of times if you just take the time to stop and think about your relationship. And then we'll approach it in the way we should instead of making things worse. And the only way that we're going to have healthy relationships is to start with ourselves and take responsibility for our own actions. You know, I, I can't make you do anything. You can't make me do anything. But I can control what I do. And uh, I think if we want healthy relationships, we need to to take on the responsibility for ourselves and do do the part that we can do ourselves. So that, that means we have to let go of our pride and uh, not just see situations from my view. I have to see it from your view too. And then I think, like I said, you have to take time and think about how much the relationship means to you. The other thing we have to do, or I had to do, and I think a lot of people do have to do this too is learn how to forgive <clears throat> not just okay forget about it I forgive you and uh, just leave it hanging like that and still be hanging on to it in the back of your mind you know that that's not forgiveness I know for me and I know a lot of other people too they say I forgive you and all this and then in the back of their mind they haven't forgot a thing it, it's still been there for years and years and that just if we don't take care of it that just builds up bitterness inside of you but when we learn how to truly forgive uh, you have peace with it and you can move on without it being in the back of your mind and with no bad feelings towards that person at all that is true forgiveness and I, I had no idea what that was, and I, I think a lot of people are in the same boat. I don't think they truly know how to forgive. I think it's something that we learn uh, once we surrender to Christ and He places His Holy Spirit in us, we learn how to forgive. I know just speaking for myself, I, I didn't even have any idea of what forgiveness was. I didn't have a clue. I thought, to me, forgiveness was, if I let you off the hook, without getting revenge on you for what you did to me, 
and just be done with you. I'm not going to have anything to do with you anymore. That was forgiveness. And uh, that's not forgiveness at all. That, that's not even close to forgiveness. And uh, I, I do believe that many of us have so many things in our past that we've never dealt with. You know, it may not have been an argument. It may be the loss of a loved one or, or something like that. But we've had so many things in our past that we've been through, hardships and, and things like that, that we have never dealt with that have caused us to build up that bitterness and stuff. And uh, if we don't get those things out of us, eventually they do manifest. They, they come to the surface, and we'll take them out on people that had nothing to do with the situation. And uh, I know that's, that's exactly how I was. I had zero experience in any kind of restoration or, or any kind of reconciliation because I never learned how to deal with anything in a healthy way. You know, nobody in my family dealt with things in a healthy way. If we had arguments, we'd just separate and go our own, go our own ways or we'd fight it out and then be mad at each other for years. We never never really dealt with anything in a healthy way. And, uh, you know, if you did something wrong to me or if I did something wrong to you, I'd just mark you off my list. I'm done with you. Uh, I had no idea how to confront somebody and say, you hurt my feelings, or, or to tell somebody, I'm sorry, and work it out. The only way I knew how to deal with anything was either fight it out or leave or just say I'm done with you, you know, I, I'm not going to deal with it. I never had to deal with anything. And, uh, you know, now, looking back, I can think of a lot of rela relationships in my past that are ended for just stupid little childish reasons that could have been worked out very easily, you know, looking back on them. And it breaks my heart because I love those people, and I miss a lot of them. But, uh, you know, those things could have been worked out if I would have had known how to work them out. So we have to learn how to forgive. And like I said a minute ago, when we don't work these things out, it makes us bitter and cold on the inside. We'll get to the point where things don't bother us anymore. We just, we get cold. And not only that, we start resenting the people that we do love. And we actually start seeing our friends and our loved ones as enemies just because we're in disagreement. And that's, that's just not true. And uh, since I have came to Christ and, you know, learned a little bit about this stuff, all that is is a, a trick of Satan. That's what he wants us to do. He knows if he can get us to not admit when we're wrong and if he can get us to be unwilling to forgive each other, we'll never accomplish what God wants to do in our lives. That's why... Uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, uh, they had a, a guy in church that was doing something that he wasn't supposed to do. So Paul said, you know, we need to not have anything to do with this guy. So in 1 Corinthians, they kicked him out of the church. And then in the second uh, letter to Cor the Corinthians, Paul writes him again, and he says, you know, we need to forgive this guy before he's overcome with grief. You know, we don't want to not have anything to do with him. We just wanted him to, to face the sin that was in his life. So in chapter 10, he says, to whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. That's the verse I wanted to concentrate on. That's what Satan does. He gets an advantage of us when we're unwilling to forgive, when we're not willing to work things out. You know, our strength is being the body of Christ. You know, we're supposed to be the church. The church is made up of many people. And if he can keep us divided, then, you know, the church has no power. That is Satan's plan to keep us divided. He knows how powerful we are together when we are the body of Christ. You know, alone, we're easy prey, too. Together, we're not, we're not that vulnerable. But when he can get us alone, 
we're easy to pray. We're easy to pick on. We're easy to, uh, you know, coax into doing things that we know we shouldn't be doing. Or if we leave the church because of an argument or a disagreement and go back to our old lifestyle, then he knows we're not a, we're not a threat to him anyhow. And then to take things a little further, even though now we're no longer in church and we don't have our body of believers to fall back on when we're going through a hard time and uh, Satan is having his way. But on top of that, then we just become living proof that the church doesn't work. And that is one of the main reasons that we need to be rooted and strong in our faith and be you know, willing to forgive one another and willing to keep our friendships is so that we can prove that church does work. Paul understood that too. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, in verse 3, he says, Give no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. You know, when people see Christians, when they see us arguing and fighting and giving up on our relationships, and just walking away from them and going right back to the ways of the world, in their eyes, you know, Christ is just a joke. They're like, huh. You know, they don't believe any of that. They think that he has no power. So then they think, what's the use? Why should I go to church? You know, we're supposed to be an example to people. And not, we shouldn't just work, our, work out our differences for our own sake and for, our, you know, to save our friendships, we should work out our differences to show people there is power in Christ. In John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, that's what Jesus is saying. And that's why he says it. He says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And this, by this, shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. Our relationships matter. Our relationships, you know, they've got to mean more to us than just being right or wrong. We have to remember that we love each other and that they're worth fighting for. And that ultimately it is the enemy trying to separate us. You know, if we were best friends a month ago, why in the world, if it's not Satan, would we want to hate each other today? Uh, I heard one of our, Howard Helton, one of our members here, one time he said, uh, he was talking about fighting in marriages. He said, I'd rather be married than right. <coughs> so even when he's wrong, he'll agree with his wife. <coughs> Just so they don't argue. So we got to be willing to work these things out with one another. And I shared with you before that we are Christ ambassadors and that he gave the ministry of, rec ministry of reconciliation to us. And we have to be the examples we're supposed to be. And I can show you that so you don't have to take my word for it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 20, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ... He is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. So our ministry is to get people to God through Jesus Christ. And the only way we can do that is to first reconcile with one another. You know, we can't be a church if we're divided. We can't be Lone Ranger churches. We, we have to get unified in the Spirit. We have to be that salt and light that Dennis preached on a few months ago. And the first thing we have to do to learn how to forgive 
is to get rid of all the bitterness and the anger and stuff that's inside of us. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how I had to do that because I had a lot of bitterness and anger, you know, angry and, and stuff like that. If I ask all of y'all right now to think of somebody who absolutely gets on your nerves or somebody that you just can't stand or somebody that you think does not deserve forgiveness, I'd say every one of you just had somebody pop into your mind. I think everybody has somebody like that in their life. I know I did. Well, that's where you start. That's where I had to start. God told me to to pick that person out in my life. And uh, it, it came to my mind instantly. I knew exactly who, who he was laying on my heart. And I was so full of hatred and bitterness towards that person, I, di I didn't, didn't have any room for forgiveness for that person. But God laid them on my heart, and he told me, you're going to be miserable until you forgive them. And I was, because I didn't want to forgive them. It took me a while to come around to, to even try to forgive them. But after God just uh, kept reminding me of that day in and day out, I had to learn how to forgive them. And he showed me that I had to forgive them, you know, without an apology. Whether they ever apologized to me or not, whether I ever talked to them again or not, I had to forgive them. Or without them making anything right, without them making any effort at all to make anything right, without getting revenge on them, or without making them pay for what they did to me and without watching them suffer. You know, all those things is what I wanted in order to forgive somebody. I wanted revenge, I wanted to watch them suffer, I wanted them to make it right, and I wanted an apology. I wanted all that stuff. God told me I had to forgive them without any of that. He said that I had to forgive them the exact same way that he forgave me, which was unconditionally. You know, God forgave me right where I was without any change whatsoever. And that's, that's what I, I learned that I had to do for them. You know, I, did, I didn't realize how bad I was, and I think most of us don't, until I surrendered to Christ and he forgave me of all my sin. And, uh, you know, once he did forgive me, and I was saved, and he placed his, his spirit in me, then I could turn around and I saw my old self from the other side. You know, like it says in, back in 2 Corinthians 5, and verse 17, you know, if any, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. So when I turned around and saw my old self, you know, it was only then that I could see who I was, that I could see the other person look just like me. You know, none of us are any different. You know, I, I thought I was better, better than him, and I think a lot of us fall into that trap. But uh, in Romans chapter 3, verses 22 through 24, it says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So it says, there is no difference in me, in him, in any of us, you know, in God's sight, we all look the same. We're all sinners. And uh, that's the way we have to see people. And when I saw him like that, you know, I was able to forgive him instantly. I mean, no conversation. There was no arguments, no nothing. When I saw him 
it was, he looked just like I did before Christ. So when I saw him like that, I was able to forgive him, truly forgive him. I mean, I have no hard feelings towards him, no resentment, none of that stuff. It's all gone. And that was all done through the Spirit. I didn't know how to forgive, but that's that's how we learn how to forgive. We have to see our we have to surrender to Christ. And then once we can see ourselves for who we truly are, then we realize that we don't have the right to not forgive anybody. You know, we can't be judgmental. We're all sinners. Uh, I sat down Sunday night and uh, I was going to do a study on unforgiveness when I got home that night. So I got out my Strong's Concordance and my Greek Dictionary and my Bible. And, you know, I was going to look up everywhere in the Bible. I was going to find everywhere in the Bible that the word unforgiveness was. I was going to find any form of the word unforgiveness, you know, like unforgiving or unforgiven. I was going to find out where every one of those was and look those verses up and do a little study on it. But <clears throat> does anybody want to guess how many times the word unforgiveness is listed in the Bible? In the concordance? None. It was not in there once. Not one time. Not even a form of the word. Absolutely none. There is no unforgiving, no unforgiven, not even a form of that word. And uh, I do not believe that's an accident because all, all scripture is inspired by God. And I do believe that that was a, done like that by divine design. Because if there was a scripture or a verse on unforgiveness, somebody somewhere would twist God's word and they would manipulate the scripture into a doctrine where unforgiveness was acceptable for some things. And uh, it's not. Nowhere in the Bible does it say we have the right to withhold forgiveness from anybody. Nowhere. There is nowhere in the Bible it says we have the right to not forgive somebody. It's the exact opposite. And that's what our salvation is based upon, is forgiveness. You know, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, that's what it's talking about. It says, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He has made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So Jesus died for us. You know, his blood paid the price for us. And our sins are forgiven because of what he did for us. Our sins are forgiven because God loves us. You know, not because we're good. None of us were good. It's not because we're good enough. Or it's not because we've earned it. You know, there's nothing we can do to earn salvation. It's all about forgiveness. <clears throat> it also says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 that God demonstrates his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Like I talked about a minute ago, when he forgave me, he, he forgave me without any change whatsoever. He met me right where I was and forgave me in the middle. of my sin, so we have to be willing to forgive people in the middle of their sin. Uh, like I said, I, I looked it up. It, it is nowhere in the Bible. The word unforgiveness is not in the Bible anywhere. But what is in the Bible is a lot of very powerful verses from Jesus himself saying that if we choose not to forgive, then Neither will the Father forgive us. I'm going to read uh, some of those. <coughs> I probably won't stop and talk on them. I'll just read through them. So if you're, if you're taking notes, you want to write these down and look them up later and read them you know, before and after them and get some context to them. But I'll just read through some of these real quick. 
And then, like I said, if you want to, you can look them back up later. In Mark chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, it says, And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, it says, Judge not, that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, this is in the Lord's Prayer. It says, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And in verses 14 and 15 of the same chapter, it says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So Jesus says himself, if we don't forgive, we will not be forgiven. <clears throat> that, to me, is serious stuff. Uh, that got me, what got me to wanting to do that study on unforgiveness is because I was doing some reading. And uh, I came across this in Matthew, and I believe it is unforgiveness. In chapter 12, verses 31 through 32, you know, these are kind of famous verses. It's talking about the verse that, I mean, the, the sin that you will not be forgiven for. It says, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaks against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. And I believe Jesus is talking about forgiveness there. He repeatedly says, we will not be forgiven if we don't forgive. And he said, all manner of sin will be forgiven. But blasphemy against the Holy Ghost will not be forgiven. So I believe when we refuse to forgive, we are rejecting what Jesus did for us on the cross. He died to pay for our sins. And if we're not willing to forgive somebody else, then we're saying what he did is not good enough for them. We're placing ourselves above Jesus. He died for the forgiveness of sin. You know, who are we to not forgive somebody? Uh, Paul backs this up in Ephesians chapter 4, in verses 32, 32. He says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. So when we don't forgive, he's saying right there, we grieve the Holy Spirit. And when we reject the Holy Spirit that saves us, all we're left with, you know, that strips us of the fruits of the Spirit. And all we're left with is our bitterness and our wrath and our anger. So if you are struggling with unforgiveness, you're not walking in the Spirit. I wasn't walking in the Spirit. You know, our flesh is still in control. Our soul is still in control. We haven't surrendered fully to Christ. And uh, you can't change that by yourself. Like I said when we first got started, we have to take that to God and confess it. And we need to talk with someone else about it. And then God will help you through the Holy Spirit to learn how to forgive. You know, it don't come natural to forgive. That's not a natural thing to us. It's spiritual. So the only way we're going to be able to do that is through the Holy Spirit. And it's not natural to take responsibility and be honest when we've done something wrong either. You know, like we talked about Adam and Eve, or 
natural tendency is to blame somebody else or to lie about it and say we didn't do it. You know, that's a spiritual thing too. We have to let the Holy Spirit give us the courage to take responsibility for things when we're in the wrong. But both of those things, we have to be willing to to own up to, you know, if we're in the wrong, be, be willing to be honest and admit it. And we have to be willing to forgive. They're equally important. You can't really have one without the other. I think Josh said Sunday, you know, you can't, you can forgive somebody without loving them, but you can't love somebody without forgiving them or something to that effect, and that's true. Both of those things are necessary if we're going to have strong relationships and become the body of Christ we're supposed to be and to, you know, to build up the church that God wants us to build up. And again, it says in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2, it says, Bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is, we just read a while ago, is to love one another. You know, so the whole world will, will know that we're his disciples. That's how we do it. We bear one another's burdens. If you're going through a hard time, I help you through it. If you do something against me, I forgive you for it. You know, verse 1 of the same chapter says, If a brother falls, you who are spiritual, help them, restore them. Restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. Consider yourself, lest you also be tempted. But... It's spiritual. That's why he puts it in there. It says, if anybody's overtaking the fault, you who are spiritual, restore them. Because it takes the spirit to be able to do those things. Uh, I want to share a parable with you. I think I've got time to read it. We've put that up there, Travis. <clears throat> this is a parable that Jesus is telling about uh, He's talking about how God forgives us of all our sins and how that God gives us, you know, forgiveness for all of our sins, but we're unwilling to forgive somebody for little things. That's just paraphrasing what this is about. But I want to read that to you uh, before we close. It's in Matthew chapter 18, if you ever want to read it, verses 21 through 35. It says, Then Peter came to him, came to Jesus, and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? <coughs> no, not seven times, Jesus replied, but seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, Please be patient with me, and I will pay it all. And that's all of us when we come to Jesus. You know, we want forgiveness. And this is what God does for us. He says, And then his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars, and he grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time, be patient with me, and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other, other servants saw this, they were very upset, and they went to the king and told him everything that had happened. And when the king called in the man, he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That is what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. 
you know, that's, that's serious stuff. <coughs> you know, there's a, a verse in there where it says, <coughs> a lot of people say, we did this in your name, we did that in your name. And then Jesus looks at him and says, you know, depart from me. I never knew you. And uh, I think if we are unforgiving and we're, you know, not willing to forgive other people, just as God has freely forgave us, then I, I don't want to hear that. You know, I don't want to take chances on it. When somebody does me wrong, I don't have the right to hold a grudge against them. I want to forgive them. I, I don't want to take a chance on hearing depart from me. I never knew you. I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on in. And I hope you do too. So not only is it important for us to admit when we're wrong and forgive one another just to save our relationships or to save our marriages or save our friendships, it's important for our church. Our church will never get strong. We'll never be united. You know, if we can't learn how to forgive one another and bear each other's burdens, if we can't realize that we're all human and we make mistakes. And uh, I don't want to take a chance on my salvation of whether or not he's going to accept me or not because he says over and over and over, if you don't forgive, my Father will not forgive you. So if you're struggling each of, or either one of those areas, if you're struggling with forgiveness or if you're struggling, you know, with admitting that you were wrong about something and asking for forgiveness, I would strongly urge you to, to take a look at that. And if somebody did pop up in your head a while ago when I asked you that question, is there anybody that uh, you can think of that you really have a hard time forgiving I would talk to God about that and get that made right because that, that bitterness does find a way to get out of you and most of the time it winds up coming out on someone that does not deserve it. So let's let's help each other. You know, that's what Celebrate Recovery is for and small groups are for and just spending time with each other. You don't even have to be at church. Just call somebody up and hang out with them. But we're here to you know, to support one another and be honest with each other. You know, James 5.16 says to <clears throat> talk about our problems together, confess our sins to each other, and talk about them. That's how we get healed. God forgives us, but when we talk to each other about them, that's how we, we find healing. So if you've got areas you need to do that, then uh, find somebody that you can talk to and, and work on them. God will help you through them. He helped me through mine. And I had tons of bitterness, tons of rage, tons of hatred. But he, he'll remove every bit of that from you. So I, that's all I got this week. And I, I truly do hope that helps somebody to get some of those things out of your life. Uh, let me pray for us, and we will be dismissed. Father, I just thank you for this message that you've laid on my heart this week. I thank you for helping me to get up here and preach it, Lord. And Father, I just know the freedom that I've felt in my life, allowing you to, to get all those things out of me. I thank you for the relationships that you have restored in my life, Lord, things that I never thought could be restored. I just thank you for the peace that I have, Lord, not having those things inside of me anymore, hanging over my head anymore. And I just pray, Father, that someone else would uh, just give you a chance, Lord, to remove those things from their life. And I pray that through your Holy Spirit, they'll find the courage to cry out to you for help and get the help that they need in those areas, to strengthen their relationships, Lord, to bring them peace, and uh, to strengthen your church, and to bring glory to your name. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>